Great, thank you. Um, either of my colleagues have questions? Okay. With that, uh, thank you very much, uh, you. Dr. Jami. Very much appreciate you being here. And um, let me invite um, our, our next two presenters. Uh, this is a, a discussion on on site water reuse. And uh, we'll invite forward Paula Kehoe and Ralph Petroff. Uh, Paula is the uh, Director of Water Resources for the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And she is responsible for diversifying San Francisco's local water supply portfolio. Uh, Ralph Petroff uh, is a globally known water technology pioneer. Um, several startups and is currently executive chairman of a um, U.S. Australian water energy startup called Nexus eWater. Uh, Nexus makes the world's first home water and energy recycler. So uh, let me welcome both of you, and um, we will start um, uh, with, uh, with Ms. Kehoe. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am Paula Kehoe, the Director of Water Resources with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And the San Francisco PUC is a department within the city and county of San Francisco. We provide three utility services, water, power, and sewer. Within our water enterprise, we're both a retailer as well as a wholesaler and serve approximately 2.6 million people in the San Francisco Bay Area. San Francisco, similar to many utilities throughout California, is diversifying its water supply portfolio. Uh, by developing local water resources. We have a robust conservation program. Um, currently, our average residential per capita is approximately 44 gallons per person per day. We have a groundwater program where we plan to blend groundwater with our surface water supplies for, uh, for potable purposes um, during normal and drought years. We also have a recycled water program uh, providing recycled water for irrigation and uh, irrigation of parks and golf courses in the city. And finally, we have a non-potable water program, which is the program I'm here to, to talk about today, which is about collecting and treating alternate water sources for non-potable applications within buildings in San Francisco. Uh, there are several types of alternate water sources, rainwater, which is water that hits our roof, storm water, which is water that hits our streets and our sidewalks and our parking lots. We also have uh, foundation drainage, uh, otherwise known as nuisance groundwater. In San Francisco, we have a number of buildings in downtown San Francisco pumping groundwater out of their basements to prevent flooding, and that groundwater goes directly to the sewer system. Uh, another type of uh, alternate water source is gray water, and in California, that's defined as water from our clothes washers, our bathtubs, our showers, and our bathroom sinks. And finally, black water, which is gray water plus water from our toilets, our dishwashers, kitchen sinks, and utility sinks. When we were building our headquarters in downtown San Francisco, we incorporated two on-site water treatment systems. Our first system, uh, our on-site system, collects and treats both the rainwater and stormwater for irrigation. And the second system, oops, sorry. The second system uh, collects and treats all of the black water that we produce in our building. Uh, we have incorporated uh, a series of engineered wetland treatment cells, which are shown on the right side of the screen. That system collects and treats all of the black water we produce in the building, and we use that water to flush our toilets and urinals. We've been able to reduce our potable water consumption by approximately 65%. When we were moving forward with our building um, in, in San Francisco, we also came across a number of other developers in San Francisco who were interested in collecting and treating their own water uh, for, within their building uh, for toilet flushing and irrigation and other applications. Um, so with additional interest from, from private developers, we recognized uh, we, need, we needed to address a number of regulatory questions associated with on-site water treatment systems. And those questions uh, included who sets water quality standards, who issues permits and provides operational oversight, who implements and requires ongoing monitoring and reporting. 
Uh, we were able to look to the California Plumbing Code um, in 2013. The Plumbing Code was updated, and it also uh, included and expanded on-site gray water uses and water quality standards. It included on-site rainwater uses um, and water quality standards as well, and also provided a number of recommendations and requirements for construction, pipe, as well as signage requirements. However, we were also we were interested in really uh, developing a program that included a layer of oversight and management. Um, and as a result, we developed a city ordinance um, that specifies the regulatory framework and permitting process for the installation and operation of on-site water treatment systems in private buildings. Um, the ordinance uh, involves four city departments, the San Francisco PUC, the San Francisco Department of Public Health, the San Francisco Department of Building Inspection, and the San Francisco Department of Public Works. Our role at the PUC is really program administration, uh, we provide both technical assistance as well as financial assistance to developers. The role of the San Francisco Department of Public Health is very, very critical and very key within our program. Um, they provide water quality standards. They also issue uh, permits to, uh, oper to operate these on-site water treatment systems, require ongoing water quality monitoring and reporting. The role of the Department of the Building Inspection uh, is when these systems are installed uh, to make sure that they are uh, installed and inspected uh, uh, appropriately. And finally, the Department of Public Works uh, is involved when a project needs to install a pipeline in the sidewalk or in the street, uh, they must obtain an encroachment permit. I just want to touch on water quality standards. That was a pretty big deal when we developed our program. Um, our black water uh, standards are based on Title 22, municipally treated recycled water standards here in California. Um, our gray water and rainwater store, uh, rain, gray water and rainwater uh, water quality standards um, were the same as the California Plumbing Code. Um, however, there aren't any stormwater and foundation drainage uh, requirements or codes uh, set, so we established our own standards, uh, which are very similar to the rainwater, um, although we do ask uh, our, our projects to look for VOCs, volatile organic compounds, um, in their sampling. Um, again, to uh, emphasize the San Francisco Department of Public Health issues a permit to operate these on-site water treatment systems and requires ongoing monitoring and reporting. Some of the key requirements uh, that we have in San Francisco, we don't allow any of the systems to be off the grid. Um, any on-site water treatment system in a building or a district in San Francisco must be connected to both the water and the sewer system. Uh, we also require backflow protection. Um, for all of our systems, uh, we require an air gap. With the exception of a rainwater system, we uh, just require an RP. There must be a certified cross-connection test prior to operating the system that's conducted by our water quality division. And also we require skills and abilities of the operator. And um, they must sign an affidavit include, uh, signing off that they have the capability of operating these systems. And when it comes to a black water treatment system, they must have a class two wastewater operator license. Our program has evolved over time. In 2012, uh, when we introduced our first ordinance, it was just based on a single building. In 2013, we went ahead and amended that ordinance to allow for district scale systems. And when we define district scales, is more than two buildings. They have the ability to share uh, the treated water. And in 2015, uh, the program became a mandatory requirement for new developments over 250,000 square feet in San Francisco. Currently, we have seven projects um, online and operating in San Francisco. I'd like to just move to some of the work that we're doing on the national level. Uh, in May of 2014, San Francisco invited a number of public agencies from North America to come to San Francisco to discuss on-site water systems um, and how they're managing these systems in their communities. We had representatives from water and wastewater agencies um, as well as public health officials from local, state, and federal agencies. Uh, two key outcomes um, were that one, uh, there is a need for a, a local uh, pro 
program that manages and oversees these systems. And secondly, um, to have consistent water quality criteria and monitoring across the country um, would be very, very helpful for all of us. So to address the first issue in terms of oversight and management, we've developed a blueprint for on-site water treatment on-site water systems. It's a step-by-step -step guide to help local communities develop a program. Additionally, we established a public health collaborative. So we have many communities throughout North America um, who are actively involved in this project that we are working on today. Um, and currently, uh, we are uh, looking at recommendations for commercial and multifamily buildings, uh, looking at consistent water quality and performance criteria, and use the end use applications that we're looking at are toilet and urinal flushing, irrigation and clothes water washing applications, uh, monitoring and reporting, as well as operational require requirements and permitting. In terms of the, uh, the overview of this project, we have a five member independent expert panel. Uh, we also have a 14-member stakeholder advisory committee uh, comprised, again, of local, state, and federal public health officials. Uh, we have uh, interactive workshops, and our final report uh, will be available in June of this year. And I'm happy to take any uh, questions or any comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We'll um, hold questions until we uh, hear from uh, Mr. Petrov. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Water technology innovation is a topic near and dear to me. I founded a water technology startup in 1975 that became a global leader. And today I'm here in California as executive chairman of Nexus Seawater, a company birthed in Australia's equivalent of Silicon Valley during their millennium drought. We moved from Australia because of California's reputation for nurturing new industries and new ideas with the Water Board and the Building Standards Committee leading the way. Um, Nexus has the first home water recycler for gray water that meets California's rigorous new certification standards for on-site gray water treatment and recycling. And as you can see, uh, it's an award-winning technology. Uh, there are two issues here, I think, that are very important. Uh, there is the issue of innovation, and then there is the issue of deployment. I'm here today to talk about how to deploy important innovations that are already commercially ready. Uh, in a nutshell, on-site residential gray water reuse is unusually beneficial and deserves statewide support to be more rapidly deployed. I want to make three points here today. First, just as all new homes in California had builder incentives to become solar ready, and builders should be incented to become recycle ready. It's only a $3,000 investment that can be upgraded at any point in the future. A second, you can fund water with a water equivalent of the new Solar Homes Partnership. It's the same mechanism of public benefits charge. As the good professor said, uh, these things are orphaned. Everything gets subsidies except for these kind of things. And then finally, we need to change our thinking on water solutions. There's more than one way to skin the cat of recycling. It's time to think outside the bricks. Uh, desal, indirect potable, direct potable, they all work and have real value, but they'll take decades to come online, and in the meantime, we could be recycling 2 million acre feet a year while we wait for these other solutions to emerge. As a longtime water person, people ask me, Ralph, is water the new oil? And I laugh and I say, no, there are many forms of energy, but water is the world's only unsubstitutable resource. So the topic today of on-site water research is, subject, is right in the sweet spot of your committee's mission to protect the world's only unsubstitutable resource. Uh, On-site residential water use could be a poster child for water innovation. Why? Well, first and foremost, it would take uh, almost half the water of the most water-efficient house being built in the state. And let me just use a little show and tell to demonstrate that. Let's imagine that this is a water-efficient house, and each of these represents 60 gallons of potable water. So two of these gallons would be used on your hyper-efficient irrigation, and then you would have one barrel of black water from sewage and toilets, 
and then two of gray water. So five barrels uh, totaling 300 gallons in a very water efficient house. What we do with on-site water recycling is to take these two, treat it until it is very clean, and then use it a second time on the lawn. So you go from five barrels down to three barrels. And this is after we have gone in the state of California. Ten years ago, it would require ten barrels. Now it's five. It could be three. And the other point to make is that uh, NSF certified gray water, new under the plumbing code for a year and a half, if you look at the water quality spectrum here, secondary treated water has a BOD of 30, biological oxygen demand, a key benchmark for water quality. Tertiary treated water is over there at 15. And then the NSF certification is actually 10 BOD. And to put things in perspective, our six-month certification test where no maintenance was permitted uh, came in at uh, less than three. Uh, technically beneath the threshold of detection. With Water This Clean, you can use it for many different purposes. On the left is non-certified gray water, and on the right is certified gray water. So two out of every three gallons in the home can get a second lease on life. Homeowner pays for water once, they get it used twice. So California's two million acre feet of gray water is a mother load of relatively clean water found in every home. So it cuts water usage in half, it's got a lower BOD than tertiary treatment, and it's relatively cheap. $8,000 a home currently for a new house, retrofits or more, and will certainly drop as volume increases. But uh, there's some interesting benefits beyond on-site water recycling. Uh, if, Paula, I'm going to volunteer you, I'm sorry I didn't have a chance, I was told we couldn't approach the chair, but how does this gray water feel to you? It's nice and warm. Yes, it is nice and warm, and there's a good reason for that. 5% of all the energy in California ends up in here, and it all comes from greenhouse gases. Now, the good news is you can extract this energy, about 80% of it, and that means that a typical home that is doing gray water and energy recycling can generate two to 4,000 kilowatt hours a year, which is what a fair-sized solar panel does. And this can be obtained for only an additional $2,000. And so think of it as a $2,000 solar roof. Now, it also eliminates greenhouse gases. Right now, 93% of all residential water heating is gas heaters that emit greenhouse gases. But there's still more. Another downstream benefit is what we call infrastretching, stretching the existing uh, infrastructure to last longer. And we do this because in a typical house, you would be putting all this back into the sewer system. But in a house that's recycled, all you're putting back is this. So it drops a big load from the sewer system and this extends the life of those expensive plants and pipes that need continual expansion. So we call it infrastretching. There's a trillion dollars of deferred maintenance on sewer system. Sewer system maintenance is always at the tail end of the, uh, of the funding chart. And then the final benefit is another significant one. Uh, you can monitor in real time and get homeowner engagement. Homeowners say, we want to help. We want to be part of the solution. And this allows them to be part of the solution. Uh, think of it as a, a Fitbit for water, an app that tells you how many gallons per day you're recycling. Uh, so to summarize the benefits, it's an abundant source of relatively clean water. It's found in every home. Water usage can be cut in half. Almost twice as many water homes can be built from the same water horse. It's extremely clean. It's cheap. It can be implemented right away instead of years from now. Its energy can be recycled. It has infrastructure benefits, and it also treats rainwater. Uh, so that's why I believe this could be the poster child for water reuse, and it supports innovation in the home. However, there are real-world challenges to implementing this poster child. In addition to all the traditional challenges of introducing any new technology, on-site reuse competes against all the traditional solutions that are massively subsidized. Uh, and this will delay widespread deployment. 
so the potential solution is one that uh, Professor Ajami has referred to before, uh, the model of energy. We had a new home solar partnership for energy. We can do the same thing with water. We can fund it with a public benefits charge. Uh, even a public benefits charge of 99 cents a month uh, gets a war chest of about $150 million a year that could be used for good things. So I hope this is something that your committee uh, will uh, consider and implement in the legislative session. Uh, we should also learn from Australia's experience. Australia heavily promoted on-site solutions, but what they primarily funded, 99%, were the, were the massive centralized solutions, particularly desal. And when the, all the water conservation measures kicked in, uh, today two-thirds of Australia's desal plants are in mothballs. So again, uh, to conclude with the three specific, oh, uh, just a quick chart here. Uh, centralized energy takes 10 years and billions and you need grid expansions. And that's why people went to solar. Uh, the same thing is true in water. You have a centralized plant that takes a long time to build and then you can do it on site very quickly. So there's no one magic solution for everything. There are multiple tools uh, that can be used. So again, in summary, build the new homes recycle ready so they can be upgraded any time in the future. A builder incentive plan modeled on the new solar home partnership funded by the public benefits charge. Uh, and then finally, think outside of the bricks and be open to uh, new solutions until that time that these remarkable solutions you'll be hearing about from, uh, from uh, our other colleagues uh, come online. Uh, so your committee has an opportunity to unravel, a, I mean, unroll a, a golden era of innovation in, uh, in water technology, and I, I hope uh, we can all move forward together and help conserve the world's only unsubstitutable resource. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Um, let me, um, just a couple of questions, and, and uh, let me, Paula, let me start with you. The, um, you know, uh, this, um, uh, you know, you, you put together a framework in San Francisco. You've been working with partners elsewhere. Um, have your partners found uh, that they have to do something different because of their localities, or are they able to um, take a look at your model and, and say, we can pretty much copy that and implement it? What's that experience been? So um, most communities look at San Francisco's model as as a, as a program as a good model. However, I think we collectively recognize that we really need to be sure that the we have the appropriate water quality standards or performance standards for these systems in place. And that's why we're engaged in this important research effort today, um, which is really looking at all of the water quality standards throughout the world, uh, including NSF 350 and the California Plumbing Code, but looking looking at all the different standards and really assessing the appropriate water quality and performance standards um, that our, our five-member expert panel will be uh, providing those recommendations. So um, we know that communities are looking for this report, so hopefully after, as a result of that, they can develop policies on the local level. Okay, thank you. Mr. Petroff, um, are, um, uh, in your experience, home builders, uh, uh, beginning to express any interest in on-site systems? Uh, or there, do we need uh, greater incentives to encourage home builders to consider this? Uh, what, what's your experience been? Well, uh, the experience has been excellent. Uh, home builders uh, really like the concept. Uh, and if they weren't all in Las Vegas uh, at the big builder conference, I think they would be uh, e echoing that comment right now because they want to sell water efficient homes because lack of water is slowing down uh, the building industry and making housing less affordable. But uh, even a modest $8,000 is enough uh, to take somebody who's trying to qualify for a $300,000 loan and, and put them over the limit. And uh, this idea of using the solar home, new solar home partnership has actually come from the, from the builders. They said it would be great to have a program like this, and I would encourage you and your staff to talk to the folks at CBIA, uh, and, and I'm confident that they will say similar things. Great. Thank you. Um, and then finally, um, Ms. Kehoe, um, our... Um, do you have any comments about uh, 
what California and the, and the state could do in terms of regulatory framework uh, that would make um, the work you're trying to do easier? Well, we actually have a, a member from the State Water Resources Control Board on our Stakeholder Advisory Committee, so I think that's a fabulous step, and that's the step in the right direction that we all need to go. So um, I, I think that we're looking forward to this report coming out in June, mm -hmm. again, to have a consensus on the appropriate water quality standards, and that will enable us to move us to the next step. Great. Well, thank you so both thank very you. much. Appreciate it. Our uh, next panel... Uh, will be related to stormwater, recycled water, indirect potable use. Uh, and let me invite forward uh, Mike Weiner, um, Weiner, I mean, uh, from um, Orange County, Deborah Mann, Toby Roy, and Brent Eidson.